I think that all roads lead back to Kiev. And I think that there's this feeling that, especially among the politicians, this political elite, that they think that life will continue going on as it has for the past 20 years. I personally think, and any soldier that you speak with here will tell you, that will not happen. We're in uh, Popasna, a town in eastern Ukraine that the Donbass Battalion uh, helped capture from the separatists a few days ago. The Donbass Battalion uh, isn't a regular Ukrainian army unit. It's made up 100% uh, of volunteers, most of whom aren't paid. Some of the volunteers uh, aren't 100% Ukrainian. There's a few Georgians here, uh, and there's even a guy who was born and raised in America, and we're going to go and meet him. He's been fighting with Donbass for the last two months. I'm of Ukrainian descent, and because of my parents' background, I'm entitled to uh, immediate Ukrainian citizenship. So before I joined the battalion, I took on Ukrainian citizenship so that I fight as a Ukrainian. Um, but originally you're from America. I'm born and raised in America, that's correct. And do you think you're the only American serving uh, on the Ukrainian side in this war? Uh, I'm the only guy that I've met, <laughs> so I'm in a six-man squad. I'm, in, I'm just a private. I insisted on being a private. I carry a weapon. I, I do my part. I go everywhere where the unit goes. Here's what I wear. Here's my knee pads. Got to have these things. Mm -hmm. Here's my uniform, British. Whatever they give you. It's got my weapon, nine millimeter. What can you contribute to the fight? I think that initially, you know, their intent is to go out there and kill these terrorists that have invaded Ukraine. But what we've learned along the way is before you get to kill these terrorists, you need to learn how to be a soldier. And I think that's been the most difficult thing for them. Whereas for me, having served in, in a professional military, I, I understand what that uh, entails. Your code name is Franco. How did that well, come it's about? Well, it's, it's Franco. So when I came here, you know, I, I wanted to be uh, Taras, Taras Shevchenko, because I've read a lot of his works over the years. He's a Ukrainian writer. That's right. And when you read about the guy, he's Ukraine's greatest revolutionary. And um, to me, it's all about revolution right now. So I couldn't have that name because there's a more senior guy here that had it first. So I had to choose another one. I just said, you know, threw out, give me Franco. This battalion has several hundred volunteers from all over Ukraine, generally more from the east. It's maybe the largest one in Ukraine. I think there's 20, 25 percent of the guys here have uh, military experience. Otherwise, it's just guys from across the whole spectrum of Ukrainian society. I would say the average age is somewhere between 35 and 40 here. It's simply people that are patriots that uh, have had enough of not, not so much maybe of this, the, the, the terrorism aspect and these separatists, but I think the thing that these people feed on is, is the whole corruption thing. And uh, when you hear the discussions among the guys, extremely passionate and uh, it's all, it all boils down to, again, this whole thing of corruption and the fact that we've not seen change for 20 years. And I personally think that this could have been finished much earlier had they been able to bring in the, the planes and the artillery. I'm told, I've been asking this question for a couple of days, how many soldiers are, are is there in this theater of operations? And it's somewhere between 20 to 25,000 is best I can make out, meaning volunteers and army guys. I mean, we're at war. You can't have partial mobilization. Let's have full mobilization. Let's get it over with. That means taking every military resource you have and bringing it to bear on the field of battle. And I think it's not 20,000 soldiers when you need probably 50 or 60,000 soldiers. We're moving in school buses. You know, it's like a sardine can. Everyone's paranoid about, you know, getting ambushed in these things because it's just a coffin and there's no transport units available. And here's another problem, you know, as you go into a city, we went into Lysychansk a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, and it's, there's no follow-on by 
civil affairs people to fix the water, the electricity, and the phone lines, the basic necessities of life. So it's a continuation of the lack of planning at, at, at all levels. I think that all roads lead back to Kiev. And I think that there's this feeling that, especially among the politicians, this political elite, that they think that life will continue going on as it has for the past 20 years. I personally think, and any soldier that you speak with here will tell you, that will not happen. I think there will be a lot of demands from not only this volunteer unit, but other volunteer units, as well as regular army guys, that life as usual in you know, in Kiev, in Parliament, cannot continue, no. The political elite has to uh, be destroyed here.